Hello, Bob. <laughs> well, uh, Jim, uh, <clears throat> your father and, and uh, LBJ were old, old friends going back to the early 50s, I guess. Even before. The, uh, Dad got to know uh, uh, President Johnson when he was a senatorial candidate in 1948, and Dad was Air Force Secretary. So he went charging down to Texas and campaigned like the Dickens for him. I think he helped a little because that was a rather close race, as you know, and every, <laughs> every vote counted, maybe twice some of them. But anyway, he, uh, they became fast friends at that time. And, uh, then, and, and 52, four, four years later, after Dad had three or four other jobs under Truman, chairman of the National Security Resources Board and RFC chairman, he, um, ran for the Senate in 52 and joined uh, the president there and the president was leader, became leader. And uh, their friendship continued. It was a little frayed, I think, as they approached 1960 because they seemed to be on the same track, you know. <laughs> Nothing like presidential politics to divide old friends for three minutes anyway. They got over that and, uh, and uh, then I think it was hard for the uh, president when Dad came out against the Vietnam War. Uh, that, that he did it from a hawk's perspective. He'd been on a carrier. A young pilot said, why does my government worry more about North Vietnamese lives than my life? And Dad said, what are you talking about? And then he showed him the kind of targets they were hitting that they didn't think were that important but well defended. And then. And then uh, the captain came down and said, yeah, that's it. So Dad said, I'm against the war, and made a speech about it. That was 1966 or 7. And, and uh, I think that, that hurt a little bit because I know it did because I remember I, I was chief of protocol at the time. And uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. But Hubert Humphrey, I took uh, the Prime Minister Lee of Singapore, who was one of the few Asians who were totally supporting President Johnson and uh, a very anti-communist kind of guy, a tough guy, double first at Oxford that kind of stuff. And uh, I took him in to see Humphrey, Vice President Humphrey, who was, had no idea that he'd be a candidate for that office at that point later on, and, and uh, said, um, Humphrey said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, even though Jimmy's dad doesn't think this is such a good idea, we know it's the right thing. And, you know, I was, it was a little awkward for me because I wasn't there to defend my father, but to present <laughs> the Prime Minister. And, uh, and as we know, Humphrey himself had to carry that load through his own campaign and began to switch toward the end. But anyway, all that's over the dam. I, I, I would like to put a marker down and, uh, that I think the President uh, was en enormously strong to, to carry all that he did all those years, get so much legislation passed, lean on the Southern Senators, get the civil rights through. Uh, I don't know anyone could have done it. Uh, anyone else could have done it in that time frame. Uh, I don't know we've ever had a president could have done it that way. So, of course, the war wore down his strength a lot and his, and his serenity. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, of course, was always um, such an important person in his life and kept him going beautifully well. So that, uh, I, I first met the President myself back in the, f right after he came to the Senate. They, they lived in Chevy Chase. And um, the girls were little and, and uh, Dad took me out to, and Mother to uh, have tea with the Johnsons on Sundays. A couple of them sat on that. They had a sort of veranda or porch and it was kind of fun to see these two boys talking about the country and the future. And uh, I don't know that they golfed together. I, I don't know that the president that much of a golfer, but Dad played a lot in those days with Clifford and that, that crowd. And um, Smathers, who was a golfer. So the, and they, but those were the days when they t talked about the committee, which would meet and uh, with Rayburn and all, and they'd sit around and, and talk uh, over a little bourbon about things. It, it was a congenial time for the Senate. There was a lot of mutual respect and, and uh, mellow discussion, um, friendship. 
the uh, uh, parenthetically, I don't, I, I don't quite see that today. The uh, people all seem to be on a slightly different track, and they're carving out their own careers. There seemed to be a, a symbiotic relationship in those days between some of these titanic individuals, you know, Russell and Irvin and and um, and uh, Senator Johnson and Dad and all. Those were pretty good days from that perspective before the before he became president they got it much harder for him the 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 um, presidential race dad didn't go into the primaries he he I think he felt and was advised by Clifford that's very costly you might be perceived as a Protestant alternative to Kennedy's your friend you don't want that to happen and uh, and the primaries um, are expensive and there's no need because Johnson and Kennedy are so strong they'll cancel each other out and you're everybody's second choice. That wasn't bad advice and it, it, it just failed by one state. It, it, we got all the way to Wyoming on the first roll call and they put Kennedy across. So then the question on the vice presidential thing, um, Dad, uh, I don't know how interested he really was in the vice presidency but it seemed logical that everybody seemed to want him and uh, I remember he called us up to his room and, and after, right after the, the nomination of Kennedy and said, boys, we got a question now. Do I accept the vice presidency? And we said, no, you don't want the vice presidency. You didn't come here to carry a guy's coat around for four to eight years. You're, you're prime of life. You've got to go back to Washington and get to work and, and make your own views known and felt. So you don't want to do that. So we did, that's very interesting. Now, Clark, what do you have to say? And if you've ever heard Clark as a barrister, you'll know what we went through at that point. He said, well, let me see now. We've nominated this young Irishman to head up the ticket, uh, the Democratic ticket. He's their standard bearer. And uh, let's see, he'll be running against Richard Milhouse Nixon. Is that? Is that right? Would you, would you fellows agree with that? Yes, of course that's right. So he'll have many questions for his fellow Democrats and how they can help him. I'm just turning over my mind. How, what question could he have that's more important than, will you go with me? Will you be my running mate in this challenge? And what I hear you boys saying is, no, you don't do that. Give us something else to do. We're not going to do that. Is that what you're saying? So we said, okay, we give up. So. I remember going to bed that night thinking, well, that's the way it's going to be. And then the next morning, um, uh, my wife and I were in the uh, hotel room in early morning and turned on the TV. And there was Kennedy. Who look, he, he clearly looked like an unmade bed. He hadn't been asleep for, for 24 hours. And he got all the names and titles wrong. He, he, he said, uh, we were thinking of... Uh, Senator Lovelace of Iowa. Well, Lovelace was the governor of Iowa. He said, we gave some consideration to Senator Docking of Kansas. Docking was the governor of Kansas. So I thought, boy, this guy's really coming apart. <laughs> and then he said, okay, and we certainly gave consideration to my good friend, Senator Symington. So we, we got the title right. And, uh, and the, it, that's what we call mixed emotions, because it, in a way, we were uh, not sure he should be a vice presidential candidate, but totally convinced he had to do it if he was asked and probably should do it. But that's when we learned that Johnson, because of the Texas and all the important reasons for taking President Johnson. So that, uh, but Dad was very, very calm about it. I think he felt maybe even slightly relieved. If you saw the, um, the way they each spoke after Kennedy's uh, announcement, and Dad threw away his notes and, and said some lovely things about Kennedy uh, as being, you know, the reason he's up there, not any of us. He worked harder, he was smarter, he got the issue straight and everything. So, so he was very uh, noble about it and, and uh, correct and went about his business as, as we had expected and hoped he might do in the Senate. And that took us uh, in, well, it was another few years before, uh, well, the, Let's see, that was 1960-61, and that's, and Dad got involved in the, uh, what we, we thought was the missile gap, that kind of, national security was his most important issue, although we took a lot of interest in other things like farming, 
for Missouri, that's an important issue too. So I didn't really uh, uh, catch up too much with the president again myself until, uh, let's see, 1964, um, he, he uh, ran uh, on his own. And that's when I took my guitar and sang all over the place, get folk songs and stuff. And I spent some time with Lynn and Lucy making f barbecues come together. And I remember they came out to St. Louis and Bush's Grove, Gussie Bush's marvelous farm out there. And they all came out for a terrific uh, barbecue fundraising thing. And, I, and, and on the strength of that, the, because of all the guitar playing, I think the, the president thought I knew something about music because when he, he was getting ready for the inaugural. He named me chairman of the music. <laughs> I knew no, absolutely nothing about bands and orchestras. I remember I sang with one once in, when I was in New York in law school, but that's about it. So I got hold of uh, Peter Duchin of New York, an old friend of mine, and he helped me put these bands together. And we, we were very good. I think we got a lot of bands from around the country, lesser known ones, but we had, of course, um, Lionel Hampton and some of the great uh, bands. We had to have Meyer Davis and, uh, and uh, I forget that other guy, but the, the, uh, we had a good inaugural. And uh, in order to f go to all the sites because of the traffic, I rode a bicycle all over the place. I just got on a bike and went from one hotel to another and to see that everything was going smoothly. It was fun. And then uh, I was asked to come back. I had, I had been, you know, in the Kennedy administration as a Food for Peace uh, deputy director under McGovern, which was a great experience to travel around and get people eating American wheat and drinking the milk. It was a wonderful thing. And then I had been Bob uh, Kennedy's AA in justice from 62 to 3 uh, in the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, this is going back before Johnson was president, K Kennedy was president. But I'm just going back over the years. And then I went back into law in Arnold Fortas and Porter in 60, I guess in uh, 63, just before the end of the President Kennedy's life and term. And uh, was asked to come back into the, into the Justice Department as, uh, I think they called it, Executive Director of the President's Committee on Juvenile Delinquency, which was uh, a committee consisting of Katzenbach as chairman, he being the AG, uh, John Gardner, who was this marvelous fellow that was secretary of HEW, I think they called it at that time, and Willard Wirt, Secretary of Labor, because those are the three agencies whose policies Im impacted on young people one way or the other. And uh, I really enjoyed that uh, job, working, to working with judges and juvenile, juvenile courts and probation officers, trying to think of ways to get kids out of trouble and keep them out of trouble. And um, that's when the president in 1966, out of the blue, I was at a conference of judges in New York and the phone rang and they said, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the White House, it's the president. I said, yeah, yeah, sure, it's the president. <laughs> and I went into the phone and I heard the voice, Jimmy, yes, Mr. President, Lloyd Hand has quit. Will you do it? Quit what, Mr. President? He was chief of protocol, and I'm asking to do it. Will you do it? Well, you know, when the President of the United States says, will you do it, even though I wasn't quite sure what it was all about, you say yes, and then you run to the dictionary and try to find out what it is you've agreed to do. <laughs> but I, I said, yes, sir, Mr. President, good. I'm glad to hear it, and boom. <laughs> and so I remember calling up my wife, Sylvia, and say, Get ready for this one. And so, anyway, then we took the oath of office, or I took it, and family standing by, and my mother and wife and two little kids. And when Dean Rusk administered the oath of office, he said a funny thing. He said, you've now graduated from the world of juvenile delinquency to the world of adult delinquency. <laughs> and, so, and so it was. I remember I had to go running off to the White House to get to, to meet the ambassador of the Sudan. And this was my, within the first half hour of my stewardship of the protocol office, I meet this fellow who speaks French only. We got through that all right. We went inside the house, the, the diplomatic entrance, you know, the back side. 
And uh, I had no idea where to take him. And I looked at the ushers like, you know, give me a hint. They just backed away and smiled. They figured, you're the chief, you know. So I walked down this corridor. I finally decided to open a door, and we walked in, and it was a broom closet. And he said to me, say uh, mon premier fois, it's my first time in, in your country, as if to say, smoke me out. You know, what is this uh, ritual? <laughs> did, it, did it happen to George Washington or something? So I said, it's my first day on the job. So we went up to, we all laughed and went up to the president and received this fellow. He was the, did I tell you, ambassador of Sudan, I think he was. And uh, so we had uh, a, a, a great run in that, uh, I say we because it's kind of a team thing. If, if, it's a, if it's a male protocol chief, and there have been a lot of very good female ones, and I think their husbands have ducked the duty, but, <laughs> but the wives don't get to do that. And you know, the president was, um, he was very generous and good to us. He could only, he got sore a couple of times. I, I, and I disappointed him once or twice, I know. I'm thinking of one time um, when Lucy was getting married, he said, absolutely no gifts from the world. I don't want the country saying the president's getting his daughter married and getting all this, these treasures from 117 other countries. So I let the uh, dean of the diplomatic corps know that we, will, we would not countenance gifts, so we, want, we were trying to to uh, forestall the possibility of any gifts. And he understood, and he produced uh, for uh, Lucy, the, the entire diplomatic corps put some money into a kind of a silver tea set or something. It was a nice, a nice way for a general collective gift. And that, I thought that was the end of it. One day, I got a call from the president. Jimmy, what about no gifts? I said, yes, sir, there were no gifts. Well, apparently, Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, decided that, never mind gifts, I'm going to give a gift. And he gave uh, it, but here's what happened. It was sent to New York. I think it was a golden uh, place setting thing, and maybe it was very valuable. And uh, I, I had uh, I'd known about it because of the customs had called me and, I, and, and said, what do we do with this? And I said, just hang on to it, put it under wraps. Uh, we'll decide later. Uh, you don't reject a gift from the emperor of any country because, and I'll tell you in a minute, what happened to Jefferson when he had a problem like that. So, um, so I thought, I've handled it. It won't get out. And uh, that's when the call came in, Jimmy. There's a story going around, and Holly Selassie sent something. And uh, he said, I think the State Department might have leaked it. And I said, I said, Mr. President, I can't imagine the State Department, anybody doing such a thing. You can't imagine that? Boy, you got no imagination, I gotta tell you. <laughs> so, in fact, I don't think I put it quite as succinctly as, as he did. Holy smokes, I didn't have any idea what uh, I mean, I was a little naive, I guess. But anyway, we got through that okay. There was a couple of other things. In Thailand, for example, the, uh, he said, now I don't want a lot of these long anthems because I get hot. Well, the, the, the anthem when we arrived in Thailand was about five minutes long. He was standing with his head bowed um, in about 112 degrees of heat looking at me through the side. So I was trembling throughout that. I'm, ju I'm jumping around, and I'm trying to think of the embarrassing moments. There was one more here. I wanted to into the gold service. Do you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, the, 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 I think it was just swallowed up. It, it may have wound up in the GSA where gifts. Uh, I had to des testify before Senator Fulbright's committee anyway on gifts to. American diplomats or, or, or officials when they go abroad, because apparently the law as it was when I took office provided that you could accept anything, but you couldn't uh, you keep it until after you left office. And so the State Department had an attic filled with all these fantastic things. And um, 
And so Fulbright said, look, at, let's say you can't take it at all if, if, if it's over $100 or something like that in value. Well, that seemed like a, uh, a, a good approach, but so that, that, that then you could keep it yourself and the department doesn't have to be a storage house. So um, the, the, um, I had to go and testify on behalf of that bill because the president supported the bill and I was the kind of the steward of the, of the results of the bill. And so Fulbright said, what do you think of this bill? And uh, I said, Senator, if you like it, I like it. And Fulbright turned, my father was on his committee, he said, I haven't had an answer like that in many, many years. Anyway, so we lived with it for a while, and I, I think they've had to hike it up a little because there's hardly anything under $100, now, except a plastic doll or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I haven't checked lately to see how protocol handles gifts, but I think probably it, they've raised the, the, the amount. And um, it's not uniformly enforced or anything like that. I think probably some people shave on that a bit, but it, the, it goes back, it's a constitutional requirement that you don't accept emoluments and gifts from foreign governments. Uh, getting back to the uh, idea of, re of refusing a gift up front, which is an affront, uh, apparently there was a consul in North Africa during Jefferson's presidency who was uh, received the viceroy of a certain sultan, and the viceroy said, the sultan is pleased with your president and pleased with your country and wants to present a pair of matched stallions to your country. And the consul said, well, you know, we have a law, you can't do that, so thanks a lot anyway, but you can't do that. And uh, so the guy said, well, that's too bad for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, there'll be no further relations between our countries, and, and the other is not so important, really, generally speaking, but quite important to me, I'll ha I, I will be beheaded. So uh, the consul says, give me another crack at this, so he writes a note to Jefferson, it goes a little boat across the Atlantic and Jefferson reads it, okay, take his stuff. And I think they were sent over here. But that, that's the, the, the moral is, uh, the lesson is, you know, the receipt, of, the receipt of a gift and the way you receive a gift is just as important, if not more important, than the giving of a gift. And that's, it goes all the way back to the days when tribes would, uh, not knowing each other too well, would leave some food outside the camp of the other one, say, look at this, is, if you take it, that means we might be friends and have to go after one another. So there are a lot of those niceties like that in the protocol. I, I, when people said, what, do you, what is protocol? I, I came up with some kind of a, of a description that it, it is really the, the practice or the art of establishing the context in which conversations and, and uh, relationships between heads of state or their ministers can occur with a minimum of difficulty, of embarrassment. And so because of that, m many rules were set up to make it work that way. And if, for example, before the Treaty of Vienna, if uh, the French ambassador and the German ambassador both wanted to be admitted to see the Queen of England or something like that, they would be fighting in the doorway to do it. And uh, people actually got wounded and maybe a couple of them were knocked off to, to get their uh, entourage inside before the other one did. I mean, that obviously had to be fixed. So they, that's when they, I think the Treaty of Vienna established the order of precedence that the country whose ambassador has, whose credentials have been accepted ranks the, in time, the, the one who came after him all the way down. And that is why, of course, here in Washington, instead of having a, a French um, dean of the corps, you had the Nicaraguan dean of the corps, Guillermo Sevilla Sacasa, because he'd been there longer than anybody else. And he was one of, I think, Samosa's brother-in-law or something like that, and a fun guy, and I, I really liked him. And of course, his crowd was knocked off later on in Nicaragua, but he's a good man. Uh, pompous, and, but, 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 but funny and pleasant, and I liked him a lot. The, uh, the other fellows that I worked with, I think, were Dobrynin, because Russia, he, he stayed there a long time, and I, I had spent some time with him going up and down the elevator during the Cuban Missile Crisis when he was presenting his government's case to Bob Kennedy in the Justice Department. 
and eventually he got braced in the White House with those photographs, and that took care of that. And uh, that, that, but uh, that moment of uh, the, when the quarantine was laid down, the that was a tough moment. I'm taking back again to 19 to the Kennedy presidency, but. Uh, uh, all of us were a little nervous about what the Russians would do when they came up to the line. They turned around and went home That's when they said Khrushchev blinked. It's true. And what we didn't know was that we had agreed secretly, really, to take our stuff out of Turkey in, in, in response to that, which was okay. A lot of foreign policy is better not published anyway when it's happening so that it doesn't get interrupted. But, um, but Johnson, um, one time we were getting ready to come down stairs, you know, the great winding stairs in the White House to a reception, maybe a dinner for a king or something. And uh, he, they played, they played Hail to the Chief. Ba, 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 ba. Of course, I was a chief of protocols, so I turned to the president and said, Mr. President, our song. <laughs> he looked at me like, are you kidding? <laughs> so, so you didn't. You, it was, light banter wasn't the, always the, <laughs> the way to get to get along. It's something desperately I'm trying to remember to tell you. I can't think what it is, but uh, let me see what I got here. How well brief was he on on, and on matters when you took somebody and uh, to visit with him? Pretty well, because um, you see the way uh, it would work when the department and the White House together decide that. They'll accept the visit from a certain sovereign. The the whole team at the department, uh, the regional assistant secretary, the desk officer of the country, they put together briefing papers, and I had the impression the president read those quite thoroughly, and he it, his questions were to the point to these fellows, and and some of them were so overawed in his presence they couldn't talk at all. They uh, and of course that sort of hampered the exchange. And this one fellow, I think he was the head of Lesotho, he, 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 he was tongue-tied. And the president kept leaning forward like a dentist looking down his throat, just hoping something would come up, you know. And uh, the guy couldn't talk at all. And uh, he was a large man, you know, about 400 pounds, something like that. And I remember saying, um, to, to, to sort of break it all up, I said, well, Mr. President, all I can tell you is that uh, Chief, what was his name, can't remember, it was, is very happy to have his visit here. He's had some very good visits with the uh, State Department representatives and with, with the Commerce Department. And, and the guy looked at me and just nodded like that because, not, you know, the visitor, he, he couldn't talk. He was just, uh, uh. And so the president, well, I'm glad to hear that. You're a good fellow and you know, I hope you enjoy your stay. And he left, never had said a word. Unlike Haile Selassie, who never stopped talking. He, the minute he got into the president's office, he let fly, and he went on. I think something like an hour had been set aside for the visit, and uh, Halle Selassie took it up entirely. And th so, the president, after he finished, said, well, "Very interesting. Ever, I'm sure glad to see you. And have a good stay." Never responded because he he never had a moment to do it. And I think he was kind of glad how he went away. We had, uh, but most of the visits were much, much more productive than either one of those two, <laughs> where there were, were, were real exchanges. We had something like 70 state and official visits while we were there, and the president had a, helped in another way, and so did Mrs. Johnson. One of the things that I thought would be useful is for the diplomatic corps to feel that they had contact with the president, even though they really don't. After they present their papers, that may be the last time they see the man or maybe at a reception or something really big, or if their king comes, uh, and, as, as like say uh, Indira Gandhi came, then, then of course um, the ambassador gets to see the president in, in, her, in her presence. Uh, I'll get back to that Gandhi visit in a second, but what I was trying to do was to um, bring the core into a situation where they felt they had been with the president. So Jack Valenti and I had with the Valenti Symington lunches, which were in the White House. We would invite about maybe up to eight compatible ambassadors, i.e., you don't put Israel and Saudi Arabia in the same room. And we would invite them to lunch. 
And then, over coffee, the president would come storming in. What's going on here? And shake hands all around, you know. Let me tell you what I had to do with the Congress today. Let me, and, and he would sort of gripe about the Congress. And these fellows would absolutely be thrilled to have this going on, you know. They've had a good lunch. The President of the United States has been with them. They can cable their, their minister back home. I've just spent lunch with the President. And it and, and gives them a real feeling, you know, of contact and of uh, a secure relationship. That when these, at the time that they were presented, uh, because there's so many of them, we had to usually have two or three be presented successively and then take them all into a waiting room for the president to talk to. And of course, that was awkward for most of them because they didn't want to take up, you're not supposed to take up a substantive uh, subject anyway on your presentation of credentials. But so that's how you get away with doing it that way. But the president would come in and say, well, is anything going on I should know about? You know, and they'd say, well, Mr. President, no, we're very glad to be with you. I remember the, uh, the president of Bulgaria, I mean, the, uh, the, the ambassador of Bulgaria who accompanied, I think, his prime minister made an observation that, uh, that, the, that strawberries were the principal product of Bulgaria or something. I may have this a little mixed up, but then the president said, that's very interesting, strawberries. Well, about uh, a month later, I encountered this ambassador at a reception. He said, I have the most terrible thing to tell you. I said, what could it be? He said, I, said, I meant to say blueberries. I said, well, not to worry. <laughs> now, I've got to tell you about Mrs. Gandhi. When she came here, the, 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 the way a, a, a state visit works, mind you, a, a state visit is a visit by a head of state as head of state. An official visit, which contains many of the same details, is a head of government coming, who may or may not be a head of state. Usually, if it's the sovereign, it's called a state visit. If it's, it, it, uh, for example, I think Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister, I and mean, I think they had a president, you know, too, like, uh, like France. So she may not have been considered the head of state. If I could be faulted on this, I accept the responsibility. But anyway, she, but, but she was treated with a state visit. And, and, and those two forms of visits have the same uh, contours. It's a three-day visit. It's an arrival, a, a, the White House lawn, you know. We, we used to do uh, other, there used to be other ways of, of getting the the sovereign to see the people, like driving through the streets, but so many, so few showed up that it, it, it was a little embarrassing. The Saudi Arabia guy, he didn't have anybody to look at, and the president was glowering at me because we were going through all these empty Washington streets. So after that, the idea was to bring in the, uh, the federal workers, a couple of thousand dependable people who could cheer and laugh and, and, then, and, and bunch them up in the White House grounds there on the South Lawn, and um, and then be prepared to receive the, the head of state and the president, who would then address them. And uh, Ms. so that's the first thing you do. Then there's a lunch, at, I think, at the State Department. And that night is the state dinner. And the next day is a reception at the embassy of the visitor, where the president comes to the reception. And, and the vice president accompanies him. And the president returns to the White House. And the vice president stays as the guest of the, of the visitor. And then the third day, uh, th there's other visits to the Foreign Relations Committee and things like that in between, and then, the, and then they go home on the third day. So when the president get, went to the Embassy of India on the second day to the reception, prior to the dinner they would have for the vice president, he stayed and stayed and stayed. And finally, I, I looked at my watch and Mr. President, it's time now. We, we take our leave and, and we'll go uh, return to the White House and Mr. Humphrey will remain. And he turned to Mrs. Gandhi and said, do I have to go? And she said, of course not, Mr. President. We'd be thrilled to have you stay for dinner. <laughs> so that's what happened. And of course, poor old Humphrey, he, he was sent all the way to the bottom of the table. You could already see him. And then, and, and then the next day, the press really leaned on me. That was a breach of protocol. 
the president was supposed to go. And I said, no, I think not. I think you've got that wrong. And if, the, if the visitor, the visiting sovereign, is a woman and invites the president for dinner and the president accepts, that's protocol. <laughs> we got around it in that way. <laughs> but that was quite, a, quite an experience. We, 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 uh, I got ready to run for Congress in 19... 68, which was in the end of my second year, I guess, as protocol. In 1967, Christmas was the visit of Levi Eshkol to, to uh, the ranch. Parenthetically, having, having your visitor come to your home spot is not only even more of a gesture of affinity and friendship and acceptance, but it's a more comfortable thing for someone like President Johnson. And I think, uh, I think uh, when he did that, he didn't do it a whole lot, because he couldn't, but it, it, it made it quite a fine impression. I mean, when Levi Eshkol came, and at that visit, he brought with him, you know, some of his military and a bunch of people. And I, I sang some folk songs for them. I remember Lucy's baby was very small and sat on the president's lap, and we had a quite a quite a time. And then I took the uh, occasion to tell the president later on I, th I was going to run for Congress uh, the following year. This was Christmas time, 67. He said, oh, I knew you were going to be a preacher, a teacher, a congressman, or some fool thing. He said, um, if now, uh, I'll campaign for you or again you, whichever you think will help you the most. <laughs> that was lovely. And he, he uh, of course, was feeling himself. December 67, think what he was going through his mind, getting ready for what he would say. And uh, in, 19, uh, in, in 68, around, I forget the date that he went on television, but that was the same night. Oh, he, he asked me, uh, uh, this is important, uh, when I told him I was going to run for Congress, he said, fine. He said, do me a favor, do not announce until the 1st of April. Next. I said, of course, Mr. President. And that was a little awkward because we had three or four candidates in there and they were all howling up and down. And I was saying, well, it's interesting, but I don't think. Well, uh, guess what? I think it was March 31st and I'm, I'm having a little dinner with some friends uh, in the Blair House, uh, the farewell dinner thing, and someone calls us to the TV. There's the President announcing his decision not to be a candidate for re-election. And my mind rolled back to that moment in December, and I realized that, it, it, in my judgment, he was turning over in his mind what he might do, but he didn't want members of his official family signaling one way or the other what his plan, in other words, leaving the ship. You know, the ship's going down, I'm getting out of here. But, uh, and so I'm quite sure that that's why he asked me to wait until f April 1st, and that date must have been in his mind. Uh, why would he? say it otherwise. I've never had that confirmed by anybody else, but maybe some of the other folks you talk to and find out what they think. That McPherson and others. But anyway, that was the thing, and I, uh, I felt, uh, of course, my, my, I went home the next day and announced, but needless to say, my announcement was somewhat uh, dwarfed by this. <laughs> so hardly anybody noticed that I was going to run for Congress. But that's what we did, and he was very, he wrote a wonderful uh, letter. I should have brought it for this, but to me, you know, thanking and thanking Sylvia for her stuff. Because what Sylvia did, um, Mrs. Johnson has, has a, is a very quick study on people and on, on uh, ideas, and uh, was so supportive of her husband. What Sylvia did, she, uh, with Mrs. Johnson's uh, agreement and, and participation, was to bring over the wives of compatible ambassadors for tea in groups of a half a dozen or so. But she would brief Mrs. Johnson, single page, one pagers on each of the wives. So these ladies would come in and be quite impressed to go up to family quarters, sit and tea is served, and Mrs. Johnson would turn to the wife of the ambassador of Malagasy or something, and Mrs. Enabuba, uh what interests me most about your career is that you were the golf champion of your, uh, of your capital city. Mrs. Johnson, how in the world did you know that? Oh, everybody knows that. So it really made quite an impression. And those, uh, 
I really think that the, uh, I don't know of a time when the diplomatic corps felt more comfortable, even though the Vietnam War was on top of all of us, with, their, with our president then in those days. And I think that was fun to kind of make those arrangements. The other thing I tried to do was to make a call on every single ambassador and just say, without an agenda, is there anything that you need or anything I can help with? And boy, you got to know a lot of these fellows that way. I only got to 70 because I couldn't work them all in. At, at, at that t time, there were 117 countries. Today, forget it, there's about 100, how many, 150 or something. <laughs> Can't keep up with them. And, uh, and of course, when the Soviet Union broke up, bingo, you had about six more. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the job of protocol is, is getting harder and harder. I was lucky because I had such wonderful staff. A fellow named Chet Carter, he was African-American. Boy, he was good. He was a deputy. He'd been a Peace Corps uh, director in some countries. And I inherited him from uh, Andrew Biddleduke and others. Of course, Lloyd was a great friend of the president, and it came on trips even though he was no longer she, because the president adored Lloyd, and they were great. They were very close. I think Lloyd ran for lieutenant governor of California. Will you be talking to Lloyd? You must be. We will be. Yeah, sure. And I think, uh, I think he decided to, to go to run.